Hey guys, how's it going? Today I'm starting some tomato and pepper seeds inside and I wanna gear this video more toward the basics of seed planting. Um, so for those of you guys who haven't done much seed starting before or maybe you haven't done any at all, and so the whole goal is to start these inside early so that we've got little plants that are big enough and ready to go outside once it warms up. Usually for that us, that means about May. Um, I'm also really excited because Proven Winners just sent out their brand new tomato and pepper seeds. I've actually grown all four of these varieties in my own garden, but I've never been able to have them as seeds because this is the first time Proven Winners has ever sold seeds, which is really exciting. So the three varieties I have, I've got a slicer tomato called Garden Treasure. There's a snacker sized tomato called Garden Gem. We've got a cherry tomato called Good Hearted and they are kind of heart shaped, which is really fun. And then a pepper called Fire Away Hot and Heavy. And I do want to get into more details about these specific varieties and kind of my experience with them and then also some of the different classifications of tomatoes and what to look for but i think i'll do that kind of toward the end of this video because i really just want to get into the seed starting portion which you can apply to any kind of tomato and pepper so let's go through the supplies that you'll need first of course you're going to need your tomato and pepper seeds and then you'll want some kind of a tag some way to identify what you put where in your planting trays i've used both plastic and wood and i tend to like plastic because the wood absorbs so much moisture and by the end i can hardly read what i have in each cell um, so we've got that you want a seed starting mix this is really important you want the proper soil this is the espoma organic seed starter i've been using it for years uh, it's different than your regular potting mix or like garden soil because it's not as heavy. Those other kinds, they're just too much for your seedlings and you want something that's loftier, lighter, so that your roots have a really easy time developing. Uh, and then you want something to grow your seeds in. And this part, you don't have to get fancy. I mean, you can use recycled yogurt cups that you've poked drainage holes in the bottom or those little jiffy pellets that you soak in water and they expand. I mean, whatever holds your soil that has drainage will work. Um, this is what I'm using. This is a seed starter kit that's actually self-watering. I won't be using that feature for a little while. I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, but the reason I use these is because they fit my lighting systems really nicely. Like they fit perfectly inside the shelves so I can line a whole bunch of them up right next to each other. And the self-watering feature is really nice once the seedlings germinate and are up a little bit. The last two things you could consider optional although I think that you do need them in order to have success and they are an initial investment, um, but well worth it, especially if you really wanna get into seed starting. The first is a seedling heat mat. So you can see this is just a flat thing that you set down on your surface, you plant your seeds, put your seeds on top, and it keeps the soil warmer because tomatoes and peppers like a warmer temperature, like somewhere between 75 and 90 is ideal for germination. So if you can speed that up, like by keeping the soil warmer, you'll have your plants a lot quicker, which may or may not be a big deal to you. If you plan on starting a little bit earlier and just knowing that it'll take longer for your seeds to germinate, that's totally fine as well. The thing about the heat mat is once your seeds have germinated, you do want to pull this because excessive heat on the root system of your plants once they're up is stressful. So you do want to keep that in mind. And then the last thing, which I think is very important, is a grow light of some kind. Um, now you can see behind me that I have got some um, grow lights that I love. I've got actually four three-tier systems. I do a lot of succulents and a lot of seed starting. So for me, it's completely worth the investment. But if you are just getting started and you're kind of thinking like, oh, I don't know how this is gonna go, let me show you a small tabletop system that works great. This is called a grow light garden. Um, very small, very great for a small scale, just getting started kind of an operation. If I tip it, hopefully these things don't fall out, but you can see it's got one light bulb right there. And it actually came with these little seed starting tubs and it has a, um, a little stand in here too because this one is self-watering as well. But I just transplanted some sweet peas out of this last week. So I kind of have the pieces and parts all over, but this gives you kind of an idea. This light hood is adjustable and it goes up and down. And there's usually a cord plugged into one side of the light that does plug into the wall. But I just wanted to show you a smaller scale option if you're just getting started for the first time. And the reason why grow lights are so important is because it creates a stronger, stockier, healthier plant. Um, a lot of people will start seeds and put them right in their brightest windowsill, which if that's what you're gonna do, I mean, go for it. 
it's still worth the effort in doing it. You might have plants that are a little bit leggier, um, but usually they'll do okay. Um, you wanna make sure to continue to rotate your plants so they're not continually reaching toward the light, but I think a grow light is 100% worth the investment. Um, and there's so many pros to starting your own seed. I mean, um, first off, you have so much more option in terms of variety. There's so many different varieties out there that you may not be able to find at your garden center. Um, you also have control over the whole process. You know that if you want an organic plant, that you have handled this plant from seed to finish and you know everything that's happened to it and you can vouch for the fact that it's 100% organic. And really just overall, the satisfaction of growing something from seed to harvesting food off of it, there's really no describing what that's like. It is the, the ultimate satisfaction and it just, I don't know, it connects you to your plants and it connects you to the earth like really nothing else can. Okay, so all that said, I think we're gonna get started with the seed planting process. So let me get my kit out of its packaging real quick. So I wanna explain this kit really quick and show you the pieces I'm not gonna be using today and I'll add in later. This is what it looks like when it's fully assembled. So first off, you've got your base. This is the water reservoir right here. It's, you know, solid obviously. There's a little tray inside that just raises everything up out of the water. And this is a wicking mat that you lay flat on the surface of the stand and then it folds over. So it folds down into the reservoir and it just wicks moisture up and then sends it across this mat right here. And then this is your seed starting reservoir tray um, that you set on top so the, the soil can wick that moisture up from the mat. And then we've also got a humidity dome. So you get all the pieces that you need. Today, I'm just gonna be taking this part out and I'm just gonna be sinking this right down into the tray and that way my heat mat will work. Otherwise, if you have this sitting with the whole contraption on top of the heat mat, it, the heat won't keep the soil warm enough between all the air or water or whatever that you have between it. So you want those to set right on that mat. So the next step is to fill our reservoirs with pre-moistened seed starting mix. So let me show you how to do that. I've got a bowl here and I'm just gonna pour some of the seed starter mix into the bowl and then we'll add a little bit of moisture. Oh, well, for crying out loud. Don't do this in a carpeted room like I'm doing right now. <laughs> so I've got my water and what I'm gonna do is just add a little bit at a time, mixing it with my hand to a point where it's just thoroughly moistened. I want it to be not to where like I squeeze it and water's dripping out. I just want it to be nicely moist. Here we go. Oh, that's perfect. Okay, see that? See how it sticks together? but there's no moisture, like I'm squeezing it with all my might and there's no moisture coming out of it, but it maintains a shape. That's what you wanna go for. And the reason why you want pre-moistened is because if you were to put dry soil in here and plant your seeds and then add water, um, it would, there likely would be air pockets in there and that soil would settle, your seeds would get dislodged and it's just a mess. It's a lot easier to keep these watered right from the beginning as well when you start with pre-moistened mix. So you wanna fill these like not packing them tight, but like tamping them lightly with your fingers like this. And I'm only gonna be filling up 16 of these cells because I'm just gonna start four cells of each one of these varieties today because I am gonna be planting more of these later. Look how much that soil settles just when I tamp. Like that's what water would do. Okay, so those are nicely filled. Um, now both pepper and tomato seeds want to be planted about a quarter inch deep. So while my hand's still nice and dirty, I'm gonna make just a slight depression right in the middle of each one of these cells. That's where our seeds will go. Rinse my hand off. First thing I'm gonna do is put my tags in here. So we've got Good Hearted, Garden Gem, Garden Treasure, and our Pepper. And so I'll plant each one of these with the respective seed. Okay, so we're gonna start with the good hearted tomato seeds first, and I'll show you what they look like. I'm gonna plant two seeds per cell, and that way I make sure I get one up. And oftentimes both of them will come up, and you can separate them if you want when they're still really young and plant the second one over in a different cell and let it develop that way. Um, I tend to just thin mine out, uh, and we'll be showing you that process later on. But these are pretty small. And I hope, let me see, I'm trying to think of how you might be able to best see them, maybe on this white paper. So that's what they look like right there. And I'm just gonna, with the end of my finger, pick up two seeds and put them in the center hole. So the good hearted 
tomatoes are in. Next, we will do the garden gem. Well, those are a little bit bigger. That makes sense, garden gems are bigger than the good hearted. So I'm just gonna wet the end of my finger, pick up two seeds, and we'll drop them in this front cell. And we'll continue with the other three. Next up are the garden treasures. And then we're gonna do the fire away hot and heavy peppers, which those seeds are a little bit lighter in color, but kind of the same shape. So now that I have all the seeds in their little uh, wells that I created, I've got a little extra seed starting mix. I'm just gonna scatter that over the top of all the seeds. Now we need to water them in. Let me grab my sprayer. So this is another supply you need. You don't need a sprayer this size. Um, I just recently graduated to this larger sprayer, but you can use a hand spray bottle if you want. The whole goal is just to water them in with a really gentle pressure so that you don't accidentally dislodge seeds. See how that comes out really nice? And when you're doing lots of seeds, having a pump sprayer instead of one you have to continually do this is so much nicer on your hand and your wrist. I actually bought three of these sprayers. I have one upstairs, one downstairs, and one in the greenhouse. <laughs> so I would never have to chase down a sprayer. Worth the investment. Perfect. So at this point, we put our humidity dome over the top, and that just helps trap in more heat and keeps the moisture in the soil. And then I will be setting this uh, underneath one of my grow lights, although it's not necessary. These seeds do not need light in order to germinate like some of your flower seeds and some other seeds that um, are out there. Uh, we wouldn't really need the grow light on until the seeds have germinated and you're seeing green. Uh, but I'll go ahead and put them under my light so they're just right where they need to stay on top of the seedling heat mat. Uh, and I won't have to water these that much. And I think that's where a lot of people maybe go wrong because it is very important to keep your seeds moist until you see germination and to really keep a close eye on the moisture level. But I think oftentimes they get watered too much. Um, and then your seedlings succumb to damping off, which is a fungus that attacks, you know, seedlings due mostly to too much moisture. So, you know, when they're underneath this seedling heat mat and all that moisture is trapped in there and they're creating kind of their own ecosystem underneath this hood, they really don't need a whole lot. So that's pretty much all there is to actually planting our seeds. And then a couple things going forward, as soon as I see my seeds have germinated, all of them are up, I will remove the seedling heat mat. And then at that point, I'll probably give them a few days still underneath the humidity dome, but I will eventually remove this as well. And I have a oscillating fan in this room that just kind of you know blows air around and it blows the seedlings a little bit, which creates a really strong seedling because they have to go through a lot outside. And you kind of want to create some of those conditions on a smaller scale so that they can build up to being able to handle the challenges they're gonna be faced with once you move them outside. The last thing I wanted to mention, which I probably should have mentioned before, is that you really want to wait until about five to six weeks before your average last frost date to start your tomato and peppers inside. Because if you have really big plants that have gotten leggy or if they're blooming or trying to set fruit, a lot of times they'll be stunted and they'll never perform as well as your younger plants will once they're outside. Um, I am starting these really, really early, but I'm kind of conducting ex an experiment here. So I want to start these, that's why I only did four cells of each. I'm gonna be starting these inside and then I'll pot them up into containers and put them out in our cold frame and see how I can do growing them on as container specimens and see how they produce see what the size difference in the plant is because I didn't do a whole lot of that with these varieties in the past couple of years. And then I'll be starting another set of these inside about mid to late March, which puts me into May so that I'll have perfect size seedlings, little transplants to put outside in my actual vegetable garden. You can usually find all of the information you need for growing, like cultivating your seedlings on either the back of the package or on the website where you're buying the seed. And I find it is different for each company. Um, there's quite a bit of information on the back of the seed packets right here like it tells you um, the fruit ripens in 65 to 72 days and what that means is after you transplant it um, into your garden 65 to 72 days you'll start seeing a bunch of fruit starting to ripen um, but all the rest of the information when you buy these seeds you'll be linked to pdfs on step-by-step -step instructions on how to plant these what to do at what time which you know for me is very helpful i know some of you guys and myself are very visual and it's nice to see little cartoon images honestly of how to do everything it's a good refresher for me um, and then it's also nice to have it larger because you know everything on the back of seed packets is always pretty small so anyway 
So let me go ahead and clean up all the rest of this stuff and I wanna talk a little bit more in depth about each one of these varieties. So the first one, the pepper, the fire away hot and heavy, I was able to grow for the first time last year. I had it in one of my raised beds in the garden. It is a spicy pepper, but it's not like super spicy and it's consistent to me, um, which I really appreciate because you get like a jalapeno and you'll get one that just like blows your lid off and then you'll have another one that's super mild and I never really know how to judge how many to put in my recipes um, because I don't want to make it so hot that I can't taste what I'm eating. Um, so I like the consistency of flavor. That's what I noticed about it. They also start out green and then they mature to orange and then to red. So they're fully mature when they're red. But if you harvest them before that point, the flavor is a little bit more mild to me and not quite as spicy. See. Now they did get, let's see, about like this tall, what is that, two feet, 18 to 24 inches or so tall. I had to stake mine a couple times uh, because it had so many peppers on it, like so much weight on this plant because the peppers were so thick on it. In fact, I think I might have pictures of a basket just full of these peppers. We'll throw it on the screen if we do. Uh, but I was really pleased with the production level of the plant. The maturity date on it is about 65 to 72 days. So that's after you transplant it. And usually for us, that means like middle part of May. Uh, but once you see that first fruit ripen, right about that point, that's the indicator time. And that means that that plant is gonna start performing like a beast. Like it will start, you'll see that first ripe pepper and then you will get a crazy amount of fruit set, a crazy amount of fruit just ripening at different times. And it goes all the way through frost. So I felt like I was harvesting off of that plant a ton. And it does have glossy leaves, which helps minimize moisture loss and makes it a lot more um, able to deal with dry conditions. That's pretty much it on the pepper. Um, and then the three tomatoes, I wanted to talk about the three different classifications that you see on tags or packets for tomatoes. And that's determinate, semi-determinate, and indeterminate. And it's very important to know which one you're growing based on the size of space that you have or the, the amount of work you wanna do with it. Um, so determinate tomatoes are type that are a bush type tomato. Um, they set most of their fruit all at one time and then they ripen kind of at the same time and then they're done for the season. Um, you don't prune these and most of them do not need to be staked. Uh, and so those are a really good type of variety if you need something shorter or if you want to be guaranteed a huge harvest all at one time, if you're doing you know, some kind of uh, canning or preserving of them. Um, then on the other end of the spectrum, you have indeterminate, which are your climbing type tomatoes. These need to be staked or supported somehow, you know, with like a tomato frame or a tomato cage. Um, they need to be pruned in order to be the most productive because they will get enormous like they will put so much of their energy into producing a ton of branches that if you keep them pruned it keeps the fruit production up a ton because they're sending uh, energy rather into blooms and uh, fruit rather than into branch growth and leaf growth indeterminate tomatoes also set fruit all throughout the whole season so they always seem to have um, uh, some kind of fruit ripening on the plant and those are really nice to have as well there's like a place for both of them then you have the semi-determinates which are somewhere in the middle um, and you'll get traits from the determinate and traits from the indeterminate. Oftentimes, they're a bushier type tomato. They kind of take from that determinate uh, like parentage and they have shorter branches, so they appear more bushy and stay more compact, but oftentimes they will fruit like an indeterminate. And so what we're dealing with here is we have got two semi-determinate, which are the good hearted and the garden gem, and one indeterminate, which is the garden treasure. And I think that's kind of what Proven Winners was going for with these varieties and choosing things that'll produce all season, because that's typically what their plants will do. They perform really well all through the season and you get a huge return for minimal amount of work. Um, and so with your good hearted and garden gem, you'll get tomatoes through the whole season and they're suited for smaller spaces. So for those of you who are growing in a smaller garden space or even in containers, those are great for that. And then of course the garden treasure just is a really good indeterminate and produces tomatoes through the whole season that are really good slicers for like hamburgers and tomatoes and just for fresh eating really. So real quick, just a few things about each one of these that I noticed. Um, I kept my garden treasure pruned really well last year and some of my tomatoes got really, really big, um, which was amazing. I really tried to keep on top of my, like pruning the suckers out. I think we did a video about that. We will be doing more of that sort of thing this year and kind of showing you along the way. We'll try to be better about showing like, 
like what we're doing right now um, to our plants so that you can be following along and doing some of those things in your garden as well if you're just learning. Um, but they, the flavor was really good and I think most of these, well all of these have been bred um, to have that really yummy like heirloom tomato taste, but their disease, resistant is, disease resistance is really high. Um, so you kind of get all the good things with these type of varieties. The Garden Gem is kind of like a Roma-esque looking tomato to me. Uh, and they had really tender skin though, which I liked. So they made it more of a snacker kind of tomato, which is what they call it. Romas are a little bit too tough and a little bit too mealy for me. They don't have that flavor. Like I don't want to necessarily just pop a Roma tomato in my mouth. Um, but Garden Gem had a really nice appeal that way. And then the Good Hearted is a fun one. So this one only grows, I think like, a foot tall, foot to 18 inches tall, and it spreads out a little bit wider than that, but you can put it in hanging baskets or containers. It kind of like trails over the edge. I put it at the edge of one of our raised beds, and I think I had pictures of this one too, and I was kind of amazed, and I, it was like a conversation piece in my garden. When anybody came over, they were like, what is that? You could hardly see any leaves. It was so full of fruit. Um, and then it got its name Good Hearted because the fruit is kind of heart-shaped, especially when it's cut. Um, when you cut them in half, you can see that heart shape, which makes it kind of fun. And I think kind of a fun one for kids to grow. So that's it, you guys. That was the project for today, getting these tomatoes and peppers planted and going in the plant room. I wanted to show you that process and then also talk to you about these. We will link all of these down below so you guys can check them out. And you still have plenty of time to get these and have them on hand for when you're ready to start your seeds this year. So anyway, thank you guys so much for watching and we will see you in the next one. Bye.